Gilbert Gottfried, and this is Gilbert Gottfried's Amazing Colossal Podcast. My co-host Frank Santo Padre and I have done over 40 or so episodes of the podcast, but we've never done a live episode until now. A week ago, we took part in a New York City podfest where we sat down in Fontana's Bar in front of a live audience with my old pal, Susie Essman. We think it turned out pretty well. Listen for yourself. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Gilbert Godfrey's amazing Colossal Podcast! Oh, okay. Welcome to the first live episode of Gilbert Gottfried's Amazing Colossal Podcast. I'm here with my co host, Frank Santo Padre. Thank you. And tonight we're joined by an original and audacious stand up comedian and actress who's appeared in movies with people like Bruce Willis, Samuel L. Jackson, and John Travolta, and in hit shows like American Dad, Blue Bloods, Law and Order, and The King of Queens. But she's probably best known for her unforgettable role as Larry David's arch enemy, Susie Green on HBO's Curb Your Enthusiasm. Please welcome our friend and the always shy and retiring, (laughs) Susie Esmond. Gilbert, you're such a good reader. (laughs) Yes. No, it was all off the top of my head. Yes, yeah. as always. Yes. So uh, if, if, if I may ask you a question that uh, people in front of the Lubavitcher trucks ask, so pardon me, you Jewish? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, interestingly yeah. enough, I played a Lubavitcher in a Hallmark Hall of Fame TV movie. <laughs> and I had to wear a shidle, and, and it was the middle of summer, it was not fun. I had to wear a shidle and the whole thing. And the more I read about it, the more I didn't enjoy. Now, is, do you know if there's any actual truth to that thing of Hasidic Jews with the whole With the, the sheet? sheet? Yeah. I knew you were gonna ask yeah, me that. Yeah. I, I knew you were gonna go there. <laughs> Having never had sex with a Hasidic Jew, I don't know for a fact. And I think that's the only way you could know, is to actually have sex with a Hasidic Jew. They don't want me. Actually, you know what? Did you ever do this? The worst gig I ever did in my life, ever, was this this Hasidic cafe in Borough Park. Did you do this? Louis Veranda booked it. Oh, it was, no. It was in Borough Park. It was a Hasidic cafe, and no women, only men were allowed in. And they, they had comedy. They had comedy. And it, I've never died a death. I mean, you're somewhat used to dying in a way that nobody else is. I never died a death like I did. Everything about me offended them. They, they wanted a minstrel show. Everything about me offended them. It was death. <laughs> Do you know, can I just tell the audience... Years ago, Gil- I met Gilbert at Catch a Rising Star, like, what, 1983, 84, something oh, like that? Oh, yeah. And, and when they would have, like, stragglers at the end of the night, they'd be, like, two, three people that wouldn't leave. <laughs> they would put Gilbert on to clear the room. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Gilbert, and who else yeah. do they put on to clear the room? Oh, wait, wait. Larry David. Oh, my God, yes. Put you and Larry yes. David on to clear the room. <laughs> 
course, with with me, I didn't give a fuck no, whether exactly. they were laughing he never or cared. not. He didn't care. He would just go on like you know blinds and and, and, and they'd do, be booing me, and I didn't he, care, he didn't and I'd go shit. worse and worse. Right. And Larry would actually get in fights. Yes, with he people would. In he the would. Audience. Larry would like if he's here. If everybody's laughing, one person looked at their watch. That's it. He's riveted on the one person that looks at their watch and starting some fight. I remember once. Uh, and we used to all go watch him because you never knew. Uh, oh, yeah. It, some, something interesting was going to happen because he was going to start Quite a fight. Quite often there'd be him and, and an audience member going out into the street. Right. <laughs> and the club would pull them apart. Right. That's how. One time I remember he was doing a bit about a bungalow. And a woman in the audience said something about what's a bungalow. This set him off. <laughs> into maybe three hours of tirades. <laughs> it was quite interesting to watch. But no, you were a different animal. You didn't give a shit. Yes. Yeah, you'd be ripping up tissue paper into spreads. You didn't care. Do you remember the first time you saw him, Susie? The first time first you saw time Gilbert? First time I saw Gilbert, I opened for him at Caroline's on 8th Avenue and 28th Street. And um, I, Richard Belzer had asked me to open for him. It was, I was introduced by Lenny, who, who died recently, uh, Richard's brother. Um, and, and then Caroline saw me and asked me then to open for Gilbert. And I didn't know who Gilbert was. And everybody said, oh, wait do you meet Gilbert. He's the funniest <laughs> thing in the world. He's brilliant, but a little odd. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I opened for him. And I, I think at that time I was just doing characters. I had never spoken. When I first started, I just did characters. I, I was too scared to speak in my own voice. And I remember I was in the village. And at that time, I don't know if you remember this, they used to have... Caroline's used to have posters plastered all over the city with your picture oh, on yes. it. So there was a picture of Gilbert in some big afro. <laughs> and it was, it was, at, it was in um, Sheridan Square. I remember this so well. And I had been in the business for like maybe three months. And then I see underneath it said, opening act, Susie Essman. And I remember I got the chills. Because not that I was listed under Gilbert. But that, <laughs> that, um, but that it was like, oh, my God, I'm, I'm really in this business now. I'm really... I'm like on a poster with my name and there's Gilbert's Fotch. And yeah, yeah. I, I remember that so well that it was like a moment. It was 1984 when I was like, oh, my God, I really – I'm a comedian. I'm, real, I'm a legitimate comedian. Then, of course, I met him and I realized he was all <laughs> Short-lived. Oh, and I remember if we could go back, we were talking about Larry David. I remembered one story. That one time Larry was on stage and he was bombing yeah. horribly. And and he was got into an argument with some guy in the audience, and and the guy says, "Hey, your mother fucks my dog," and and Larry goes, "Oh yeah, well I bet your dog doesn't enjoy it." He's quick, that boy. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Larry wrote a special for Gilbert, which not a lot of people know. Oh, Norman's Corner? Norman's Corner. Corner. Yes. Norman's, Corner. Yeah. Norman's Corner. It was so bad that <laughs> it, it almost kept... Um, when, when he was trying to get the deal for Seinfeld, uh, uh, the, guy, the studio said, uh, wait, who, who's, who's writing it? Larry David? Didn't he do that piece of shit for Gilbert Godfrey? <laughs> what was it? You were a newsstand? Yes, yeah. yes. You had a newsstand and different characters came up uh, to yeah, the newsstand? Yeah, yeah. it was yeah, bad. It, it now, was Gil, <laughs> Gil, were you and Larry on SNL at the same time? Uh, no, no. He was... But you had equally horrible experiences. Uh, he was on Fridays when I was on SNL. So, and then he went on SNL after Fridays or before? Uh, yeah. yeah, he, he did Fridays with Michael Richards. Yes, and then, and you were on SNL in eighty. Uh, yeah. Right. I but only thirteen. Eighty episodes. to eighty-one. Right. And yeah, he was on with Michael Richards and then uh, Julia Louis Dreyfus. That's right. Yeah, Larry was post Gilbert on SNL. Oh, so then Larry went to SNL after you. Uh huh. Right. He was in the Brad Hall. They never Julia wanted Louis. me. SNL. You auditioned. Oh, I auditioned times? all the time, and yeah. I did all these characters. They had no int I was too Jewish. I was too. They had no interest in me whatsoever. You? After well, after they had. <laughs> after you, they gave up on the Jews. Is what happened. You ruined it for every Jewish comedian. After that. <laughs> But 
what what made when did you first what was your first appearance anywhere? Uh, when I was eight, and I was at sleepaway camp. <laughs> Not that far back. So. We would, well, but it's interesting because we were doing, they, they were doing The Wizard of Oz. So I wanted to be Dorothy so bad. And I have a decent singing voice. And I, I d auditioned and I sang Over the Rainbow and I was crying. And they gave it to some little blonde who couldn't act her way out of a paper bag. And me, they gave the Wicked Witch of the West. Yeah. So, and the part was pantomime. They had the witch pantomime. And I was like, fuck this shit. <laughs> And I went to the counselor. I said, could I write my own part? So she said, yes. So I did, and I did a whole melting scene. I was very careful not to make it Margaret Hamilton, to make it different, but equally as, you know, effective. I don't want to be derivative yeah, of Margaret exactly. Hamilton. At eight, I didn't want to be derivative sure. of Margaret Hamilton and, and to end up doing Maxwell House commercials. So, um, That's right. So then after I died, I was supposed to sneak under the, the curtain, you know, because I was dead. But instead, I got so many applause, I had to stand up out of my death and take a bow. And then at curtain call, I got more applause than Dorothy. And that's when I knew, you don't want to play the ingenue. You want to play the wicked fucking witch. You know, you want to play like the character. So at eight years old, I got that, that they didn't want me as the ingenue. And you know what? I didn't want them. So I, that's when I started realizing that I was going to be a character actress. At eight. <laughs> <laughs> Much more fun sure. to be the witch than Glinda. So that was my first, you know, then it took me many, many years before I got on stage again. Well, tell us a little bit about that. In your 20s, you were a little bit aimless. You didn't know what you wanted to do. Right. You were depressed. I was depressed. I was uh, very depressed. I was uh, uh, living with a bad guy. I was uh, selling drugs. I was in, in a very bad place. And friends, uh, I was waitressing friends. I used to go, go back into the kitchen and imitate all the customers. That's how I kept myself entertained. And my friends that I was waiting with kind of uh, dared me or forced me to get up at an open mic, which I then did. But I used to just do these characters, you know, like... I don't know, whoever. they people from my family, mm -hmm. which was psychotic, you know. Let's what, get into the selling drugs part. <laughs> 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 I know you never knew go that there. about no, me. No, no. Well, I had this boyfriend who was a drug dealer, but he couldn't... <laughs> He couldn't, um, he had, couldn't, like, it was coke, and he couldn't, you know, this was the 80s, and he couldn't, he, he used to do it. I never did it, because why would I want a drug to make me more insane than I already was? You know, I didn't want an up thing. I wanted, like, tranquilizing things to shut me the fuck up. So he gave it all to me to take care of, because he couldn't handle it. So he, it's like he put his little, you know, wife into business, and I used to, I was cute in those days, and I used to go around to, like, Wall Street guys, you know, and sell them drugs it's and they gave me money and that was it and I kind of equate that it was like easy it was kind of like you make people laugh and they hand you money you hand them cocaine and they give you money same shit not, you know <laughs> I'm not proud of it but you know now how how did you actually go did you just walk up to people on the street no 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 I oh. wasn't I wasn't like loose joints loose joints I wasn't like that <laughs> a businesswoman. You know, I knew somebody and they knew me and then the blah, blah, and then the, the, somebody else in their office and then somebody else in their office. But then there would be guys at the apartment with guns and it was not pretty. <laughs> you know, like, like, there would be like mobster kind of guys around. I, 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 it, it, well, I look back and I'm horrified. And now that I have daughters that age, I'm horrified by my entire behavior. Luckily, I found comedy to get me out of the drug dealing trade. <laughs> <laughs> who, I, I, who, if I didn't find stand-up, where the fuck would I be now? I don't know. Take us through that a little bit. You took a comedy class. I took a comedy class, and I was so scared. You know, they would give us an assignment. You know, the, I don't know what, like, you know, write something about what you did last summer or whatever. And I was so scared that I would cut the next class because I was petrified to get up and, and talk in front of people. And then there was this guy. We, I went out with everybody from the class, and there was this one guy in the class who said, well, what if you do these characters? What if I just interview you and you improvise as the characters? So we did that one day, and I, I was getting laughs. So I was like, oh, wow, this is incredible. So then I kind of put an act together of these characters, and I went to an open mic night, at, mostly magic. Do you remember that on Carmine Street? Oh, they yeah. Had, they had an open mic on Tuesday nights, and... Um, and I did my, you know, I, did, I had got five minutes together, which I did in like a minute and a half, you know, because I was a wreck. 
and um, and there were these guys there, Paul Herzog and Burt Levitt, and they came they they came over to me and they said we're opening up a comedy club called Comedy U, uh, and we'd like you to work there. And I was like, yeah, yeah, fine. I gave my number. Never got on stage again. Was petrified, horrified that I did it. A couple of months later, they called me. They said. We're, we're opening the club. We want you to come work there. Can you come down and do 10 minutes? And me, like a fucking idiot, said, yes. I didn't have 10 minutes. You know, 10 <laughs> minutes stand-up is oh, a lot. Oh, yeah. So I wrote 10 minutes, and I went, and they just kept on putting me on stage for like six months. I never went anywhere else. And that's where I met uh, uh, Joy. They had a women's comedy night. Mm -hmm. And that's where I met Joy Behar, and uh, Rita Rudner was there, and Carol Liefer, and all these girls that were, you know, had been doing it longer than me. Um, and... Um, that from there, I met more comedians, and then I went up to Catch a Rising. They wouldn't put me on stage at Catch a Rising Star for years. What was his name? Flip? Oh. That I asshole wouldn't put me on. <laughs> wait, wait. They, well, Rick Newman ran. Yeah, it. yeah, but no, this was after, post Rick. This was after Rick. Oh, they, oh there, was, uh, there was Richard Fields who took Yeah, yeah, what it. an asshole he was. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> The, anyway, but the, you, Lucian you, Hole you, put me on at the Lucian, comic strip. Sure. He was my big... So, and then eventually I started developing, you know, a, a, an act in my voice. I remember Ronnie Shakes, Oliver Sholem, um, was a g great comedian, died young. He yeah. must have been... How old was he? Yeah, I think he was like 40. Yeah, had a heart attack. And I remember him saying to me, it takes at least five years before you find your voice as a comedian. I remember thinking, yeah, it's not, that's not going to be like that for me. I'll find it next month. But it took me like 10. You know, it <laughs> oh. takes you a really long time to know who you are on stage, I think. And, and what you're, you know, Gilbert has such a specific persona. And Very you're specific. always true to that persona. But, I, you know, it, so it took me a long time to develop and, and figure out who I was on stage. But once I did, it was smooth sailing for me. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it is. It's like. The amount of years where you just have no idea. No idea what you're doing, yeah. and you're doing it in front of people. You can't do it in the mirror right. at home. You can't really do it in a class. You could take a class in the very beginning, you know, but you have to do it in front of strangers. And we would be at these clubs, Catch a Rising Star and the Comic Strip and, you know, wherever. We would, and like on a Friday, Saturday night, we'd do like five, six, seven shows a night. Remember, that's how we oh, made our yeah. money. That's what it was cash. And, and I see when I started, there wasn't even the cab fare. There wasn't oh, really? even a five dollar. Well, cab fare was like seven bucks. They well, you were that. fifteen yeah. when you started, right? Gilbert? Oh yeah. yeah. And what did you have to years, say at fifteen? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> for years, I was doing it, and I'd go up. Sometimes I'd go up and I'd do great. And and if you wanted like a seltzer or something, they charge you. Really? Yeah. Wow. But see, later on, I think we got really smart where we would just go to clubs that had food. Oh, yes. At, you know, I don't know if you know this, but Gilbert is notoriously cheap. That's like a known fact. <laughs> so we would have, you know, you would do like on a Saturday night, you'd do like a few clubs uptown on the Upper East Side. Then you go downtown to like the duplex and Green Street and blah, blah. And like Gilbert would always like find out where you were going and get in the cab with you and then never share the fare. <laughs> <laughs> and I would go home from catch on the second day of the bus. On the bus. He's in the middle of like a freezing cold night with snowing and raining. We'd see him standing on the corner <laughs> waiting from, from 77th Street and 1st Avenue to the Lower East Side on the bus. And I remember people who couldn't believe it, how, because they would do it every night, they would say to me, so, uh, all right, uh, Three o'clock in the morning, when the, and I go, oh, that's the three twelve bus, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I know it down to the second. Were they on time? Yeah. Oh, uh, no, no. <laughs> when did you decide that Gilbert was your favorite comic? Um, very shortly. Gilbert can make me laugh in a way that nobody else made me laugh. It's just like when I, he would just, just, I don't know. He just hit a funny bone in me of a, of a almost like a childhood you know, uh, giggle fest. But then we would laugh a lot together. Because I, I think part of that was like we would be at the clubs and we'd be hanging out at the bar. And we would talk about old movies a lot. Oh, yes. We, we always did. But then there were other people that we knew in common that we could make fun of to each other, which always right. tickled us well, tremendously. That was the most rewarding but part. Whenever you bad mouth another person, Yeah, when you, you find know, out you hate best. all the same yes. people, that's a bond. Right, for sure. That's a strong bond. Uh, and being a movie buff, I mean, when the first right. time I saw Gilbert, I think I was, I was a teenager at, at, at uh, the comic strip. And being a movie buff, 
here's a comic doing refer references to Ben Gazzara. Right, and right, Ted right. Bessel. Right. And Norman Fell. Right, And it Norman was the Fell. strangest thing I'd ever seen in right. my life. And well, what happens when you're a kid... <laughs> rewarding to somebody but, who grew up on that but, stuff. But yeah, when you're a kid and you're a movie buff, and when we were kids, this, there was no, you know, VHS. There was you caught you watched Million Dollar Movie yeah. over and right. over. Or the 430 over movie. Again. The 430, the right. ding 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 right. ding ding. Right. And <clears throat> but when you found somebody else that had that passion, you thought you were a freak and yeah. you were the only one that had that passion. And then when I would, you know, go out and meet people, when I started being a comedian, there was other people that had these strange esoteric passions that knew who Norman Fell was, <laughs> you, you know, and, and you found a bond there in something that was really important, I think. How many people know who Norman Fell was? That's pretty good. <laughs> That's because you're here. <laughs> That's right. Let me tell you something. My husband knows who nobody is. Nobody. Tell us, when you met Jimmy, your husband, he had never seen you perform. He had never seen you on television. No, he had never seen me in Curb, because otherwise, why would he have gone out with me? You know, I mean, it's like... <laughs> he didn't have cable. He didn't have HBO. And he thought I was this delightful woman. <laughs> and then I didn't let him... See. It's interesting, because uh, Joy Behar, who, as you know, is my best friend, she, uh, when she first met Steve, her now husband... She, for a year, she didn't tell him she was yeah. a comedian. Yeah, that's part of it. You know, and, and it's, it's, I think it's, men, men would go on the road, even Gilbert, before he was married to the lovely Dara, and get laid, okay? <laughs> Women would go on the road, See, and nobody wanted anything to do with us. You know, we were just like <laughs> pariah. So a funny... I, I was getting laid on the road? Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> but... <laughs> But women find funny men attractive. Men don't find funny women attractive as much. Because they were more scared, I guess. I don't know. Is that why Joy never told Steve that she was a comic? For the first year. She was year, afraid that he would not be attracted to she her. She was afraid that he would just be, you know, yeah, exactly. But she no, wanted see, to let him I, be the funny one. I think women say they find funny guys attractive. <laughs> see, it's like now... There are these women who uh, will go, oh, see, I always was attracted to guys like Larry David. Right. And I think, well, there are a million guys just like Larry David wandering <laughs> up and down. Why, why don't you want to go after them and fuck because them? Because it... <laughs> <laughs> you know, can I tell you something? Because they're not. Here, here, I get this all the time. I get this constantly where men come up to me, you know, at Zay bars or whatever and say to me, I'm exactly like Larry David. And I have to hold myself back from saying, no, you're annoying. You're an annoying Jewish accountant from Great Neck. <laughs> Larry is a genius. You're just a neurotic, annoying schlepper, basically. That's hilarious. Gilbert, you know... <laughs> okay, so Gilbert okay. and I, in, I think it was 1992 when we were in Miami doing the one night stands oh, for yeah, HBO. Oh yeah, that was like an assembly line. Yeah, how they do those. and they yeah. did these one night stands on HBO, which was the you know half hour comedy specials, and they would pair comedians together. And Gilbert and I were the same night, yeah. where we performed in in the theater the same night, and. Um, <clears throat> So we were hanging out at, at, the, at the, the Doral in Miami Beach, and we'd be on the phone every night, just hysterical. Oh, and by the way, speaking of which, I scraped my knee really bad. I tripped and fell because I was a nervous wreck because I was doing this special. And I had like, it looked like a really bad rug burn on my knee. And my boyfriend at the time thought that I had had sex with Gilbert. <laughs> And didn't believe me. And I was like, no, I hurt my knee. He's like, that's a rug burn. And I know you were down there with Gilbert. It was like, no. <laughs> I never told you that. So, <laughs> wow. So, there, there was, so he, there was, what? he thought you were doing it like doggy exactly. style. And exactly. I, I want you to all picture that right now. <laughs> Her on all fours and we, me behind her. We yeah. would have just been laughing. It wouldn't have worked because we would have just been laughing. So there was this... So there was this comedian... <laughs> there was this comedian who was doing the warm-ups, who came down from New York, who was doing the warm-ups, African-American comedian. You never heard of her. So, um, oh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So before Gilbert got there, she said to me, you know, I'm really... 
I'm really nervous about Gilbert coming because when he comes, he always makes fun of me and always says things about me and always, you know, like asks me what I think of good times and, <laughs> and like. <laughs> I like the Jefferson. <laughs> so I said to her, Yeah, I used I, I said, used to go, who did you prefer? Amos or Andrew? <laughs> Which one do you think? Right. So I said to her, I said to her, we'll call her Linda. Okay. I said to Linda, I said, listen, you know what? D- don't, he doesn't mean it. He's just, he's, that's his humor. Just ignore him. Just don't pay attention to him. Just ignore him. And he'll just stop because if he's not getting attention, he's not going to go. For it. So Gilbert calls me. So he comes down. Then he calls me that night in the, in the hotel room. We weren't having sex. And, um, and he says, you know, I, was, I, was, I did my usual thing with Linda and started saying something to her about Amos and Andy. And she said to me, I'm not listening to you. I'm ignoring you. I'm not paying attention to you. I'm not, and like, she, she was, I told her to ignore him. So instead of ignoring him, she's like, I'm ignoring you. I'm not listening to you. I'm not paying attention to you. Yeah, because you had been saying, ignore him. Don't pay attention to him. <laughs> and so all she yes, did... I'm ignoring you. I'm, I'm not, not paying, paying attention. So for years, we, we've laughed over that. That's a, you know, it's like 12-year-olds. And, and the, the funny thing is, then, you wrote about it in your book. I did. And, and they, for, they told you not to mention her being black. That's right. Yes. That's right. <laughs> sort of Which, kills the story. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there was no... <laughs> Because, you know, when you write a book, they say to you over and over, put in anecdotes. Put in anecdotes. He's just like, I don't remember any fucking thing that happened. You know, I don't remember these things. They just want, they want details about what did Gilbert say? What did Larry David say? What did it it's, like, ah. it's a funny book, regardless. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. Frank has questions. He's very well prepared. Gilbert doesn't prepare a goddamn thing. <laughs> You know, I was thinking about this, about because yeah. I know this is about the movies, and I listened to the podcast with Robert Osborne, which, by the way, I ran into him the other day on 57th Street. Nothing could have made me more excited. The nicest man. Oh, it's like, there's Robert Osborne. I, I yes. got, like, you know, oh, I was yes, very, very yes. excited. But um, I was thinking about growing up and, and how, what changed, you know, how, the exposure to movies that, that we got. And for me, it was when I went, was in college... They would show, Saturday nights, they would show movies. They would show full-length movies uncut. And you started to realize these movies that you had watched your entire life, when you saw them uncut, it was a completely different movie. You know, I didn't even know Humphrey Bogart was in Casablanca when I first saw it. <laughs> right. I thought it was all about Paul uh, Ein Reed. Right. Yeah, I, I remember Robert Osborne was on the podcast, and he said... He got everyone together for this one musical he loved that was coming on TV. And they watched it, and there was no music in it. Oh, that's right. Yes. That's right. Yeah, they cut it out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was Cover Girl. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So you're obsessed with Turner Classic movies, you I, it, Well, you know, it's, it's my background. It's my white noise. It's what I have on in the background. For many reasons. One, it's so visually, you know, especially the black and whites. I just like to have it on. And also, there's no commercials. Right. You know, it's just Robert Osborne and Ben Mankiewicz talking every now and then. Yeah. And Drew Barrymore. <laughs> and Gil- Gilbert was on as a, uh, as as a, a guest, guest program. Yeah, yeah, I know. That I've, was a lot of that's fun. the only time I was ever jealous of you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Other than the time when I was uh, fucking you, dog. From behind. <laughs> yes. That was the. <laughs> what kind of narcissist am I that I would be jealous of you <laughs> fucking you from behind? It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's interesting, though, about the movies? I've been thinking about this. You know, when I watched movies when I was a kid, or, or, or even TV shows, you know, what we grew up on, the Donna Reed and Leave it to Beaver sure. and blah, blah, uh, uh, Father Knows Best, it, uh, or, or just seeing, you know, the movies from the 40s, it never had anything to do with me. It was always pure fantasy because it so completely had nothing to do with my upbringing. 
It was so, com it wasn't until I saw Annie Hall and I saw the family around the dinner table talking about disease was the first time that I thought, oh, that's like my family. The man has so, diabetes. Yeah, it's the first time I ever saw something right. on screen that I thought, oh, that's like my family. Other than that, it was like, this is nothing like anything that I ever grew up with. And the funny thing about the old movies and old TV shows like, well, like Andy Griffith. I right. thought this is a totally non-Jewish show right. you could get. And it was old Jews Who creating wrote it. Yeah. all this Aaron stuff. Rubin yeah. created yeah. the Dandy Griffith show. Yeah. 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 And it was a spinoff of the Danny Thomas show, <laughs> which was also created by Jewish guys. Yeah, yeah, but Danny People was forget. not. For me, it was always now, hard now because... wait, what? wait. Since he brought up Danny Thomas... <laughs> I know where you're going. You're not going to do it, are you? Okay, would you tell the story? <laughs> well, I don't know the story. I wow. just know the rumors of, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that... And it wasn't at St. Jude's, I'll tell you right now. <laughs> that according to rumor, Danny Thomas would lie under a glass coffee table... <laughs> And hookers, some say black hookers, I, you pick your racial type, and, and the hookers would shit on the coffee table as Danny Thomas looked up at the shit coming and out said, of And said, make room for duty. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. Some say that there wasn't a table involved and they shit on him directly. We don't know if yeah. any of this is true, we, but we've heard the rumors. But then they say, look, there's a rumor that Gilbert fucked me from behind <laughs> so in a hotel room in Miami. I'll tell you right now, it's not true. No, so. that was Danny Thomas <laughs> fucking you from behind. You know, that was another interesting thing. They always, yeah. it was like, well, he wasn't Jewish. He was what, Lebanese or uh, something? Lebanese, yeah. I think. But they so. always had the, the shiksa wife, no matter who they were. Yeah, you have a theory on well, this, the Hollywood you know, shiksa. I, I actually just finished reading this, the biography of Samuel Goldwyn. Um, but I, I read about all these guys all the time. And these guys who created Hollywood were these, they, they were... Peddlers. They were so they, Schmata salesmen. They used to call he them. was a glove salesman, right. or they were, and they they bought into Nickelodeons is what they first did, and then they somehow it's amazing to think you know how they went from having a Nickelodeon with a Schmata to you know MGM. Samuel Goldfish. Sa yeah, Schmuel Goldfish. Schmuel Goldfish. Was Goldfish. His name, right. Actually, um, right. <clears throat> but you know these are the guys that created Hollywood, and they were so worried about assimilation. And they were the ones that created the Shiksa goddess, which has ruined my career all these fucking years. Um, <laughs> but because they were so, they all married non-Jewish girls. They all, uh, uh, Louis B. Mayer converted to, to be Episcopalian. They, they, cre they were so worried, and rightfully so, because there was a, a, a huge movement about, you know, Jews own the entire industry, and it, it, you know, in the, in the 30s and um, so they were frightened about that, that they were bent over backwards to be not Jewish and to not have any kind of, even though all the writers were Jewish sure. and all the directors, Billy Wilder and William Wilder and Mankiewicz's and blah, blah. I forget one of the uh, uh, movie studio heads, uh, you know, old Jew, and he changed <laughs> his birthday. I think it was either to make it Christmas or uh, 4th of July. That was Louis B. Mayer. Louis yeah, Mayer. I, I think it was Louis B. Mayer, yeah. It was, yeah. It was Incredible. Apparent. And yeah. they all raised their kids like Christians. Yes, well, uh, Samuel, Go well, his wife was Catholic and his kids were raised Catholic. But yeah, it was, but they, it was all about, I mean, in television, I also have this theory that, that all the television, ex not all, I don't want to go into that conspiracy, but a lot of television executives were Jewish guys, and it was okay for them to have the funny Jewish guys, the Seinfelds and the Paul Reisers and the blah, blah, blah. But the Jewish women, that just reminded them of their mother and their sister, and that, so that it, it couldn't be. They couldn't have us. And it, it's funny, I, I remember reading that when they were creating Golden Girls. Yeah. Uh, the the uh, heads of the studio said to them, look, there's two things that people hate. Divorced women and Jews. Really? <laughs> <laughs> so they were all, they all acted very Jewish, like B. Arthur yeah. and the mother. 
but they said they were Italian. Yeah, right. Because you could right. get away with it. You're a lot like George sure. Costanza. Right. Yeah. Well, I always wondered about that. Yeah, why? No. Why did George Costanza? With why, Jerry because, Stiller yeah. as, well, because, as his father. Because wasn't the. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Very strange. If that's not Chewy Choo Chuman, I, I don't know who is. Yeah, Seinfeld was the most Jewish show in the world, right. and none of them were supposed to be I Jews. I know. Well, what Larry kind of corrected that in Curb, and, you know, totally Jewed it up in Curb, <laughs> in a way that... Well, if, if, if the George Costanza character was based on Larry, which mm-hmm. he was, yeah. why was the decision made to make him Italian? Because I it, it was more acceptable in some ways. Frank Santo Padre. Ah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, I changed it. It was Fishbein. <laughs> 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 Sorry. And, and Elaine, Elaine was a total Jewish girl. Yeah, well, Julia's yeah. Jewish. Yeah. She's a French Jew, yeah. But, but they made her, you know, the uh, Elaine Bennis. Yeah, you know, yeah, 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 decoy. yeah, decoy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and I've also heard you say it's strange that Seinfeld's a mega hit, and it's a very Jewish show. Yeah. And you would think that in an industry where everyone loves to imitate success. Well, y- you know, even more to the point, Frank, is... When I was first coming up as a comic, The Nanny was a hugely popular show. And that was this, you know, Jewish girl from Queens with a heavy New York accent. So the, the networks are not that, they, they're always copycatting. If something's a hit, then they try. Of course. So you would have think, who, if that's a huge hit, who are they going to try to develop something with after that? No, they thought it was an aberration. They thought The Nanny was yes, an anomaly, exactly, that it shouldn't exactly. have been. Exactly. And, the, exactly. and obviously they thought the same thing about Seinfeld. Yeah. Because there was no other Jewish and the, show. And yet, and yet it, Larry went on to do Curb, which was hugely successful. Not in the way that Seinfeld right. was, because it was HBO, not Network, but, you know, hugely Well, they tried, successful. what's his name, Silverman, in a show called The Single Guy. Oh, yeah. Is that actor's name? Help me out. Uh, I don't remember. He, yeah, he uh, was from... Um, Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Silverman. Yes, From yes. Weekend at Bernie's. They, I mean, they were, that was their attempt. There were a couple. Friends was supposed yeah. to be another Seinfeld, but nobody was Jewish. And then there was that I guess show Ross and Monica. called It's Like You Know was well, the Well, that title. was Peter Melman's show. Yeah. I spent... Uh, one of the Seinfeld yeah. writers. Yes. They tried. That was the L.A. Seinfeld. You know event. what? It's really hard to make a hit show regardless of whether you're Jewish or not. May I just say? <laughs> it's like there's so many right. things that go into it. and so many, You could have a great cast and great writing and just somehow... It, you know, Seinfeld, something about Seinfeld just clicked and the chemistry of it worked. And it, you know, but it's, it's really, really hard to get a show that the public likes and the network likes and to keep it on the air, it's almost impossible. And yeah. when they try to create something, and it's like, it's a cliche that you'll see in comedy bits, but they actually do sell stuff by going, well, it's, it's kind of um, Seinfeld, Seinfeld meets, meets Law and Order. Right, right, and right. it's like, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. Meets Lost. But it's like it's like it's like William Goldman famously said: nobody knows anything. It's true. You know, I mean, they, you just don't know what's going to work, and you don't know. You you could see it in movies. You could see a, a great cast, and it just falls apart, and it doesn't work. And then something else just is just magic. You know, you what you what like we mentioned Casablanca. Why is that movie so magical, and why does every piece of it works every time you watch it? It just does. Who and knows? What, what would it have been with Ronald Reagan? With Ronald, yeah, and, right. and yet the script wasn't written until the, you know, they were writing it right. day by day. That's and right. Nobody knew it was going to be that. It's just, it's just, you know. They, they expected that show, uh, that movie to be a disaster. Right. Because everything was wrong with it. Exactly. And yet it's, it's, you know, one of the greatest movies ever made. And I could watch it over and over and over again. So it's just, you, you can't decide on what these things are. Happy accidents. And what's fascinating about Casablanca to me, going back to the Jews again, (laughs) is most of the Nazi army were Jewish actors (laughs) from Germany. (laughs) Right. Right. And and they were like in these tiny parts in Casablanca where they have like one line. It would be like a, a Jew from Europe who used to be a major star there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, it was it was they, they, it was sad what what happened to all those great German. I mean, the German film sure. industry was huge, and again, but a lot of those people, William Wyler and Billy Wilder and all those, you know, the, the von Sternbergs sure. and all those people came to the U.S. Michael and, and Curtiz, who directed Michael Curtiz, uh, and created Casablanca. an amazing industry. You know, from that, Billy Wilder is, is to me the most amazing of all of them because he wrote some of the wittiest, most amazing scripts, and English... Taught himself English first. He didn't speak English. Yeah, I know, it's, it's incredible. 
you know, it was his second language. And he wrote language. great scripts even before he started directing. And funny, you know, yeah. some like it hot. I yeah. mean, just really funny. So many. And to have humor in another language, I think, is really difficult. Although you've been doing it for many <laughs> years, Gilly. <laughs> In the interest of time, Susie, yeah. uh, let's talk about let's talk about Curb because we've been talking about Larry yeah. most of the evening, and I don't think everybody knows how you were cast. I mean, you've told the story a couple of times, but how did you get the part? Oh, it's a well, sort of an indirect path. I did, um, I did a, a roast. Gilbert's king of the roasts, you know. But roasts are hard. You see, you're really good at it because you're so jokey. For me, roasts yeah. are really hard. You know, um, I did a roast of Jerry Stiller. Were you on that roast? I uh, no. Okay. No wonder it was so bad. <laughs> so I did a roast of Jerry Stiller, and um, it was the Friars Club roast, sure. and it was aired on Comedy Central. And Comedy Central, the Friars Club put me in to be on the roast because I had done several. I had done a Danny Aiello roast where he <laughs> cried, and um, <laughs> didn't Belzer Dan- make him cry? Well, no, the Danny yeah. Aiello roast. <laughs> he had this. Uh, Joy was the roast master. She was the first female roast master. And, and he had his show. What was the name of that show? Della Ventura. Della Ventura had just come out. And it just the reviews were just fucking brutal. I mean, they just ripped him a new asshole. And Richard Belzer gets up at the roast and reads the reviews. <laughs> <laughs> and Danny cried. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Danny <laughs> he's a very sentimental guy, Danny. You know, he's a sweetheart. We had him on the show. He's, I know. He's, he's a, I mean, a I love Danny. He's, he's sweet. a very sweet guy. But he couldn't, and, you know, bells are so mean, you know. So, um, and I say that lovingly. So, anyway, the, the Comedy Central said they didn't want me. I, I was too female, too old, too Jewish, whatever. I was not their demographic, which is this other demographic thing pisses the fuck me off. So, um... <laughs> So anyway, the Friars Club pushed for it, and I worked really. I had laryngitis, which I think was emotional. I worked really hard on that roast, and uh, I worked with our friend Larry Ambrose, who was a great writer. And I had lines like, you know, uh, the, on the dais, uh, my opening line was, "Alan King, do you ever think you'd live so long that your prostate would be a bi- as big as your ego?" You know, and, <laughs> and Maury Povich, I said, "Maury, we all wondered why you married Connie Chung." Then I realized we all know Jews love to eat Chinese, <laughs> and you know. I, it was very jokey, which yeah. is not really my style, but it was very jokey. And then Larry David saw that, and he was, I hadn't seen him in years because he moved to L.A. You know, we used to all hang out, but oh. then he moved to L.A. and who saw him? And he married Lori, who saw him? And um, he, he saw called it when me. Comedy Central aired it. No, he saw, actually saw it before that. Because oh, okay. Jason was the, uh, Jason, Jason Alexander was the, was the roast master. Right. And, um, and he saw it, and he, and he had this part in mind of Jeff's wife, and then he just called me and offered me the part. He, says, he called me over, and never forget this. Susie, hi, it's LD. I was like, oh, hi, I haven't heard from you in 10 years. What's up? Uh, I have this, uh, the part I want you to do, uh, the HBO show. I said, well, what's the part? Don't worry about it, you could do it. I said, well, <laughs> I said, well, can you send me the script? There's no script, there's no script. It's just you're Jeff Garland's wife, and there's no script, and you, you just play yourself. And I was like, okay, well, oh, and there's no money, there's no money. <laughs> And you're going to have to fly yourself out and put yourself up. <laughs> and I was like, well, Larry, you know, I, I love you, and I'm sure it's going to be brilliant, and I'm happy to do it for scale, but I, I'm not flying myself out. and put. Well, that's, that's the way it is. And I was like, oh, forget it. Then, you know, then they called me back, and they found money to fly me coach. <laughs> and they did. I, we, we had no money on that show. We didn't, have, we didn't have trailers. We didn't have, we had nothing. We didn't have port of You were nothing. a day player for a while, weren't you? I was a day player for three years. Yeah. Yeah, I was day scale for three years. Yeah, three seasons. I know. Thank you. People see you on TV. They think you're loaded. You know that? They, they see oh, you on TV. Oh, yes. They think yeah. you're loaded. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not complaining. But, yeah. And you never discussed the character with him? You with just, Larry? Yeah. No. I mean, the only... Du- <laughs> it's funny, now that I think about it. The first scene that I had to do where I was in true Susie Green form... Um, first, the first episode that I did was just kind of introducing me and whatever. Then the next episode was where, you know, the only, he gave me two, uh, um, directions. One was, I want you to rip Jeff a new asshole, which I thought I'd been in relationships before I could do this. And then the other direction he gave me was, don't, don't make her too Jewish. I didn't listen to that direction. (laughs) 
So, no, we never discussed the character. We just kind of had like a dialogue of the unconscious going on that he kind of saw what I was doing and then he started writing more towards that, the outlines that he, the, the outlines that he would write. And I kind of saw what he wanted, but we never discussed it. We just kind of organically... But that, you know, that show is, is like that. That's one of those happy accident shows that just kind of evolved in that way. And, and that was, that's another one of those shows that gets brought up by people going, well, it's a kind of a like curb. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That's yeah. the new catchphrase yeah, now. Yeah. This show is like a new curb. And it's not, because curb is, Larry has story brain that's just brilliant. I really think Larry's genius in so many ways, but it's really story that's his true genius. And when you read those outlines and you see how they're constructed, it's just, it's, I can't even understand how he gets to it. And I have a comedian's brain. I read it and it's, it's transcendent to me. I have no idea how he does it. And nobody else can do that. It's not this willy-nilly improv that we do. It's very structured. You know exactly what's happening in each scene. And that, so it's not like Curb. Because if, unless Larry's creating it, it's not like Curb. And what was the first TV you did? Oh, wow. I don't even remember. Was it Baby Boom? Well, Baby Boom, yeah, <laughs> that was a fucking disaster. Sorry to bring it up. <laughs> they, cast, they, cast, they cast Joy and I in the series of Baby Boom, which was a takeoff of the Diane Keaton movie. Right. But Kate Jackson from Charlie's Angels was playing the lead not character. Not Diane Keaton. No, not Diane Keaton. But it was Charles Shire and Nancy Myers who created the movie. And they cast Joy as a German nanny. Okay, like a Helga von yeah. Brunhilde, yeah. and they cast me as the secretary, which was a little closer. But the whole thing, we went out to L.A. We were miserable. We were just uh, the whole thing was a nightmare. It lasted, I think, it lasted 13 episodes. But it was just the last I remember of Kate Jackson was she took us the last night. She took us to dinner at Spago, and I just remember her, you know, in the bathroom, having drunk too much. <laughs> And Gilbert was fucking her from behind. Of course. <laughs> Can I get sued for saying something like that on a I, podcast? I what is a podcast? What's a pod? Why is it a pod? That's a good question. We're at the podcast festival. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. We'll check with Jeremy, the founder of the festival. It's, it's because Kevin McCarthy invented it. Oh, the pods. Yes, okay, see? yes, I get it. Who gets no that one, reference? No one caught that. I get it. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yes, what, Frank. What was, your, uh, what was your favorite Curb episode? I know people ask you this. Um, you I know, have... Th I have different ones. Each season, there's a new different one. Like, I loved the last season. I loved the one where, I, you know, I, if you would have said to me those days at Catch a Rising Star that someday I was going to be driving around Harlem having an orgasm in a car next to Larry. Oh, that's a great one. The broken car. And being cars. paid for it. <laughs> I would have said no fucking way. You know what's interesting? I, I, if you would have said to anybody at the bar in those days at Catch a Rising Star that Larry David was going to be rich than all of us combined, we would have said oh, no. Insane. Yeah. No, we never yeah. would have believed it. Yeah. And yet he is. It's amazing. I, I thought he was one of those people that he would either be like a multi billionaire that he is or be homeless. Be homeless, yeah. which is what he thought he was going to be. He thought he was going to be homeless. I like his line that he says, I went from being a poor schmuck to a rich prick. You're right. <laughs> Always like that. But, you know, he said to me recently, in those days, if somebody had said to him, you could have $200 a week for the rest of your life, he would have just accepted that. You know, he wasn't that ambitious. But neither were we, really. Yeah. Hey, it was, it was, that was a very strange time. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. Were, just like, we were just into doing the, the, the jokes and then going to the green kitchen afterwards and laughing. And we never really thought about, like, the career and getting a sit. Well, you had Norman's Corner. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in your face. <laughs> <laughs> or in wherever it was when I'm fuck you doggy style. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have to say, Susie, I'm, I'm partial to the episode with Sherry O'Terry as the crazy That nanny. was a great, there's a lot of great episodes. you out the window. I love the doll. The doll's you know, great. Because what's more Where's fun? Where's the fucking head? Yeah, what's more fun than being able to scream, give me the fucking head, you know. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> but it, to me, that that job, I, I don't think I'll ever have a better job. That I just get to, you know, go there and just scream and yell and tell Larry and Jeff to go fuck themselves. And it's it it was. I mean, I did it for eight seasons. The most fun job I ever had, and much less stressful than stand up. I mean, the stand up is so stressful even now to this day. It's just so stressful. Acting is like nothing. It's easy. Yeah, people don't realize how 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 different it is stand up oh, than yeah. acting. Acting is like you get up from your chair, they go, "Okay, come this way, say this line." Especially, don't you love doing cartoons voiceovers? Oh my god, it's the yes. most fun. Yeah, it's yeah. really fun. Tell us about that. You did Bolt. The yeah, Bolt because you go. I mean, it's it's hard. I don't want to say it's hard. It's draining. You know, because you you by yourself in a room with headphones and you're acting with a with a dog or a cat or a pigeon or whatever the fuck you're <laughs> acting with, and but you're by yourself, the pigeon's not really there, and um, <laughs> so you have to do the line like ten ten different times, all different ways, faster, slower, louder, softer. But it, it, I enjoy it. I enjoy voiceover. Oh, it's it's a lot of fun. Yeah. But it, it, and it is like you're and the almost, residuals are nice. Oh yeah. Yeah. And you're almost never with the other people. Never. I've never had yeah, been. Yeah. Like, Have you I, ever been with oh, the other people? Well, well, I love hearing those stories of like, oh my God, during Aladdin when Gilbert Gottfried and Robin Williams got together, I never ran into them once. Really? Yeah. <laughs> you didn't work with Robin the entire time no, you were doing Aladdin. No, not once. Did you work with anybody? Yeah. Uh, I think with the guy that played Jafar, I worked with a couple of times. Uh -huh. And then they would have me, like, coming in by myself going, But mostly Jafar. by yourself. Yeah. And the thing that I remember is that I had to do a lot of running scenes, so it became like this porn, because I had to do all these <laughs> scenes where I was like, <laughs> you know, like out of breath. and Sort of like your orgasm. Yeah, exactly. And then screaming, falling. Ah! Like you're all that kind of stuff. Well, I, I remember when they were recording the Aladdin cartoon and the princess is running and and Aladdin is going, uh, come this way, hurry, hurry, hurry. And I, I had them play this tape a hundred times because I loved it. She's going, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. <laughs> is that because you don't get to hear that off? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I heard it once. <laughs> in, in Miami. Uh, yes. <laughs> when, when I was doggy fucking Susie. <laughs> yes, Frank. You're not, tell your daughters not to listen to this episode. My daughters? Yeah. Oh, God. Did, did strangers actually come up to you in the street and say, curse me out, do, do a Susie Green? They do it every Green? day. Still? Every, uh, constantly. People want me to tell them to go fuck themselves. You know, I'm not always in the mood. <laughs> <laughs> you're going about your day, you're buying produce, you're whatever, and people just like, you know, like gleefully want you to just curse at them. It's a, it's a job. <laughs> it's work. Yeah, it's work. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's. Uh, <laughs> and by the way, you don't get it for free. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah, I can't tell you to go fuck yourself for free. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and what am I going to take, 10 bucks on the street? <laughs> oh. Bad. Bad form. You should wrap. Oh, we're wrapping? Oh, yeah. yeah we haven't even talked about the movies. Okay, talk about the movies. I have nothing Tell to say. What's your favorite? You told me on the phone that gangster pictures and musicals are your two, uh, yes. your two weaknesses. Yeah. So give us a gangster picture that My you My favorite would... gangster picture? Yeah. Dr Desert Island movie. Uh, Maltese Falcon. Really? Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. just be because the dialogue, you know, you're, you're cracking Foxy on me. And, it, you know, it's just, I think John Houston wrote that, didn't he? he? Did. It was Dashiell Hammett, but First I think. First picture. Yeah. Yeah, so I would say that. I really prefer the Asphalt Jungle from John Huston. I know that's how Well, I seat. love that also. That's Marilyn that. Monroe's yeah. first, you know. Just love that one. Yes, she was very... What, Gil? No, no, I was just going to say that Maltese Falcon is one of those movies where if you, if you had never seen Bogart, Peter Lorre, Sidney Greenstreet, or Elijah Cook, and you said, just show me one thing, 
Oh, that it would explains. be that. Yeah. That would be and, that. And what, one of my favorite scenes is the very end when they find out that, that the Maltese Falcon's friend and Peter Laurie says, you stupid fathead, you bloated <laughs> idiot. It's one of my favorite things. I, I think I kind of stole that from him in my Susie Green years. You did. You yes, borrowed from exactly, Peter Laurie. Exactly. Would never I, I remember one of my favorite scenes there is when they're all yelling at each other. Bogart, Astor, and Laurie and the cops are trying to figure out... And Laurie uh, picks up his cane and starts sneaking out. Out, yeah. And they go, where do you think you're going? And he goes, I'm not going anywhere. It's getting quite late. <laughs> <laughs> there, are better, there are different, darker gangster films, but that one I could just watch over and over and over again. Because it's, it's got a really interesting plot. With the golden, jewel-encrusted falcon. What a load of shit that was. Yes, the, the MacGuffin. Yeah, the MacGuffin. Right. Yeah, yeah exactly. And musicals, my favorite musical? I, I don't know. Uh, the Bandwagon, probably. We talked to Julie Newmar on the podcast. Well, that would be bandwagon. Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. Yeah, she was she's in, in the Bandwagon, too. Is she in the Bandwagon? Yeah, she's a dancer. She's very the... large. Yeah. <laughs> she was, was statuesque. Tall, so they had to put her in the back. Yeah. she was... Yeah, but the Whatever bandwagon, well, any Fred Astaire, any Fred Astaire would be. I used to wake up, I used to set my alarm because on Channel 9 they would have Fred and Ginger movies at 1 o'clock in the morning. Remember that? Oh, and yeah. I would set my alarm to watch them because that to me was just pure joy and delight to watch that. And I remember the first time I saw Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. That Did was, nothing for me. Yeah. That's no. a boy thing. No, yeah. that's three stooges. <laughs> Abbott and Costello, like Stooges. Three Stooges. Yeah. No, I would have rather watched Shirley Temple movies, <laughs> which I did every Saturday morning. Yeah, no, uh, you liked Abbott and Costello. Oh, yeah. I loved you, it. Well, you used to do that whole bit about uh, Abbott and Costello. Da -da -da -da. <laughs> Remember that thing you used to yes. do? Yeah, oh, it it's so hard to explain to people. Yes, he, well, used, he used to do. <laughs> he used to do uh, Lou Costello and Citizen Kane. Can you do that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think we should okay. end on that. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you have anything to plug? Yeah. What's coming up, Susan? Oh, I don't know. I got a lot of gigs. <laughs> which I'm dreading every yeah. single oh, one of them. You and me both. Oh, Isn't God. Isn't that funny? Oh, God. Yeah, but yeah, it's fun. It's good. Yeah, yeah. They, you make the people laugh and they pay you money, and I'm very thankful that they still laugh and they still pay me in my old age. Almost 60. <laughs> um, Gilbert and I are the same age, which we found out that day in Miami. No. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of gigs. You go to my website. Okay. Susie and uh, I, I am actually going to be doing two guest stars on SVU. Great. Tell us yes. about it. I, I don't know. I haven't seen my the scripts. My wife's favorite show. I haven't seen the scripts yet, so I, I don't know what the character is. Okay. A Jew? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe a Jew lawyer. Go figure. Um, and then there's a, a, another thing that I can't talk about that might be happening. Okay. But I'll come back. Please do. I'll come back and plug that. Please do. Okay. So this has been Gilbert Gottfried's Amazing Colossal Podcast, the first live one. Yes. Thank you all. Thank you. With me and my co-host, Frank Santo Padre, and our guest and friend, Susie Esmond. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming. We appreciate it very much. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming.